So, Troy, you're in charge of the Bible verses today, aren't you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll try to tell the right ones. Uh, Luke's Gospel, tra uh, chapter 18, is where I want to read, first of all. Uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 18, verse 9. J this is um, actually, the, this starts with a parable, uh, a little teaching of Jesus. And then there's a couple of incidents that I think um, illustrate what it is that he's talking about. And before I begin reading, just uh, we should just remind ourselves that, first of all, that Jesus in his teaching, uh, his intent, the intent of his teaching was to move or motivate his listeners to a position of believing in him. He came into the world as a savior, uh, to die on the cross for our sins and to pay the penalty for our sins so that everyone who believes in him would be saved or have everlasting life. That's sort of summing up what John 3.16 says, which is a good little summation of, of the gospel. But his intent of his teaching is to try to move his hearers uh, to a position of, of accepting that or believing that or trusting in him, placing their faith in him as a savior because that's the, the basis of our salvation. Uh, and just to set the stage in fully, um, and we know this, of course, he appeared in, uh, in Israel as their Messiah and as the last prophet sent to the nation of Israel. And these were people who already had a religion. Uh, they already had the law. They already knew something about God. He came to fulfill all of the promises and all of the prophecies and all of the expectations uh, that were expressed in the Old Testament. And he's attempting to and uh, trying to motivate his hearers to a new position, a position of entering into a new covenant based on faith in him. Now in verse 9, before he says this parable, it tells us in verse 9 what the meaning or the intent or the purpose of this parable is. He spoke this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Now this right away tells us what the purpose is. It's about trust. He's saying, uh, it's saying that he's aiming it at, he's, in, he's got in his mind uh, people who are trusting in themselves. So that's what, that's what it's about. Now the first thing I want to say before, the, before reading this is that remember that a parable is a made up story. What we're about to read here are not about actual people, but uh, it's a made up story. Jesus is making it up. He has created this story to illustrate a point or to illustrate a moral principle. So the, the people that we're about to read about are, are not real individuals, but they are created by Jesus to illustrate certain, uh, we might say, attitudes. Uh, one of them he commends, and one of them he uh, criticizes. And it's sort of uh, remarkable, um, in a way, uh, which, which is which. Verse 10, remember, this is a made-up story. Jesus is telling a story. Two men went to the temple to pray. The one is a Pharisee, the other a publican. Not a Republican, uh, just... <laughs> A publican. <laughs> just a little joke there. A um, uh, publican uh, is commonly uh, presented as a tax collector. Uh, I've read other writings that say a publican uh, could mean a person who ran a public house, like an, like an inn, uh, or a, a place where there's also that, those doubled as taverns sometimes. And so those people were also kind of on the low rung of, of the social ladder. And in the event, publicans, whether they're tax collectors or people who ran taverns or inns, uh, they had a reputation for being uh, a lax morally. Uh, they were looked down upon by um, the higher strata of society, like the Pharisees, for instance. They were considered to be notorious sinners, in other words. So. Uh, two men went to the temple to pray. The Pharisee, and by the way, Pharisees had the reputation of being uh, the most holy people around. So one uh, with a reputation for being the most holy, the other just the opposite. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this publican. 
In other words, in case you don't know what I'm talking about, I thank you that I'm not like him. That's what he's saying. Now, remember, this is a, a, per, a character that Jesus is, is making up here. So we can, we can presume that what he's saying about himself is true, that he, that he actually is living a, a righteous life as far as outward um, behavior is concerned. We can assume that actually, yes, he's not an extortioner. He's not an adulterer. He's not unjust. He's, his doing is correct, you see. Remember what this parable is about. It didn't say it's about doing. It said it's about trusting. Remember that? This is a parable that is about trusting, not doing. This man's doing was correct. He's got a bad attitude because he, he's prideful and he's looking at himself and he looks down on, on, the, uh, on the publican. And by the way, that, that's not uncommon. Uh, you know, and you may know this from your own experience. Uh, it's sort of like, uh, I think psychologically, we feel better if there's someone we can look down on. <laughs> you understand? We, it makes us feel a little better about ourselves if there's someone worse than us. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, but that's not how it should be. We should understand that even though there's someone worse than us, that doesn't necessarily make us better. <laughs> In other words, just because there's someone worse than me, that doesn't mean that that makes me right in the sight of God. Um, I remember, and I've told this story before, so you might have heard it before, but it illustrates the point. When, uh, when I first started going out to BJCC to do Bible studies and things, uh, I went with a man named Merlin Booty, and he was a farmer and lived out south of town out by Hopeton, and we would go together. He would pick me up at my house and drive me out there. and. When you go into the prisons uh, there, uh, they used to be a little more relaxed about it. Now they're a lot more strict. You have to have a, 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 a state-issued badge uh, that identifies you as a volunteer. So uh, we had those uh, volunteers' badges hung around our necks. And so uh, one week Merlin picked me up and he said, let me tell you what happened last week. And I said, okay, tell me. And uh, so he said, after I dropped you off at your house, I uh, was headed home and I stopped in the edge of town out here. There's a, what's it called, the, uh, the Jiffy Trip or the, whatever. The, which one? Let's see. Yeah, well, anyway, the convenience store, yeah. Right. And to get a drink, a little Coke, you know, a drink. And uh, so he went and got his drink and he went up to the counter to pay for it. And the woman behind the counter says, what's that badge hanging around your neck? And he says, oh, that's my volunteer's badge. I go out to BJCC and we have a Bible study. And he said, when he said that, this woman got all huffy-like and she just kind of swelled up. Like, like that. She said, well, she said, I'll tell you what I think. Those men are getting just what they deserve. <laughs> and so he said, well, I hope you don't get what you deserve. <laughs> now, now, see, there, there's a couple of things. That's funny. You know, I agree. That is funny. But why did she say that? What would motivate somebody to say that? Well, she, she's just giving uh, expression to an attitude a lot of people carry around and don't say that, when I can look at people that I feel like are worse than me, I feel better about myself. That's really what she's saying. And rightly, Merlin sort of, now see, I probably would have just let it go and not said anything, but he was the kind of person, if you knew him, you know this is true. He was the kind of person who didn't keep things to himself. <laughs> he would tell you exactly what he thought. And um, he, he uh, expressed it rightly. He said, well, you know, Sure, they may be getting what they deserve, but uh, maybe you don't deserve the best either, you know. Well, n none of us, you see, here's the point. Uh, even though somebody might be worse than us, uh, none of us measure up to God's perfect standard, you see. And I think that's the point that Jesus is getting ready to make here. So he says, uh, here's how the Pharisee prays. <clears throat> I thank thee that I'm not as other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this publican. Uh, those are the things he didn't do. Uh, verse 12 are the things he does do. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of, of all that I possess. These are all good things. Uh, see, there's nothing wrong with his doing. That's the point. There's nothing wrong with his doing. What's wrong about him is his trusting. He said he's, uh, this is spoken to those who trusted in themselves. For us to enter into salvation in this new covenant, it's based on our trust in Jesus as a Savior. If you're going to look at yourself and trust in your own self, uh, then you're not trusting in Jesus. You're supposed to trust in Him. And notice this. Here's, here's how he compares it. Here's his comparison. This is the attitude that he actually commends. Verse 13, the publican, standing afar off, 
would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, what, are, what is he actually saying about this man? He's saying that this man has nothing to boast about. He has no uh, good actions that he can boast about before God. And he simply comes, listen to this now, empty-handed. He comes empty-handed without any thought of his own uh, uh, justification, without trying to justify himself, without saying anything in his own defense, without saying, well, I tried, I did this, I did that. He only says, uh, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He has an a attitude of humility. Uh, he's not looking at himself. He's placing his hope and his trust in a merciful God. You see that? This is not about doing. Jesus is emphasizing that, that it's not about your doing, it's about your trusting. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to say these exact words, <laughs> but it's the attitude that Jesus is commending. And let me say it again. It's not about your doing, it's about your trusting. You see, uh, it, it's not about the things that we do. This is um, the essence of the theology that Paul presents in this verse that I have behind me here when Paul wrote, by grace you're saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Very interesting. Sounds almost like Paul might have known this, but he didn't know this. Paul wasn't one of the 12 disciples. He didn't know probably that Jesus had even said this, yet he had the exact precise same theology because Jesus gave it to him. Um, so what was right about the publican, even though all of his works and his actions were bad and were, good, were not right, uh, were wrong, uh, his trusting was correct. And Jesus says in verse 14, I tell you this man went down to his house justified. Do you know what justified means? It means made right. It means in alignment, brought into alignment. This man uh, went home in alignment with God's requirements, in alignment with what God's looking for. He went home right, even though his actions uh, were not commendable, even though he couldn't boast about uh, a lot of good works. But his trusting was in the right place. That's the point of this. He's empty-handed and his trust is in God. Uh, he says, Jesus says, for everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. Everyone that humbles himself shall be exalted. He's commending an attitude. Now we have a couple of stories that I think illustrate this parable. Verse 15 says, and they brought unto him infants that he would touch them. And when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them unto him saying, suffer, that means permit Permit little children to come unto me, forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. That's very interesting. Of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom as a little child shall in no wise enter in. Well, in the context of what we just read, here's one thing about little infants. You ever looked at an infant? You ever held an infant in your arms? I know you have. You've seen them. You've they don't have anything to boast about, do they? They don't have any, uh, any good works to boast about. They don't have, they're empty-handed, may I say it that way? They're absolutely empty-handed. Jesus is commending uh, infants as an example. <laughs> he says, of such is the kingdom of heaven. You see, this is a little bit um, like a, a paradox to most people's thinking because it's very deeply ingrained in our thinking that heaven is a reward for good behavior. Everybody pretty much thinks that. And even in the church, that idea is, is hard to eradicate. Even though we know on paper that it says, by grace you're saved through faith and that not of yourselves is the gift of God. When push comes to shove, uh, back in the back of our minds, we, we might be thinking that, uh, well, I hope I've done enough good things. I, I hope I've been good enough. I hope, you know, I hope my good things outweigh my bad things. You see, that idea of your good, thing, your good deeds outweighing your bad deeds, if that's how it's going to be, if there's going to be a big scale in your good deeds on one side and your bad deeds on the other side, then you can just cross Jesus out of the picture because he doesn't fit in that kind of... It's either going to be you trusting in you or you trusting in Jesus. Now, we've just got to make a decision and stick with it. We choose to trust in Jesus. You see, here's the thing. 
a, a lot of people will agree that that's how we start off as a Christian. That's how we start. Uh, but then, how do we then maintain and live our Christian life? Well, you remember the parable we just read of the two men. Uh, one was the Pharisee boasting about his life, and the other was the publican who said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. A lot of Christians will agree we start like the publican saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. But ironically, uh, they sort of suggest that we should live our lives like the Pharisee, trusting in all the things that we do. No, it's, it's this way from start to finish. We trust in Jesus, and that's all we have. And that's the only thing that commends us. Uh, we have, we're empty-handed. We should regard ourselves that way. Jesus uses these infants as an example. We have nothing to boast about. We have nothing to uh, claim any credit for. Uh, you know, in Ephesians 2.8 that I just quoted to you, it says, By grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any sh man should boast. The next verse, in verse 10, says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that he before ordained. Paul even suggests that our good works that we do as Christians are those that God has ordained to be done through us. Uh, he even gives God the credit for anything that, that we might do. So, uh, these little infants, uh, empty-handed, have nothing to boast about. Now, having read all that, keep that in mind when we read the next story. See, one problem we have uh, reading the Bible is we, we tend to read what we're reading and forget what we read before. You've got to keep in mind what we just read when you read this next story. Or you might miss the point. Verse 18. A certain ruler asked him, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now the thing we're missing when we read this is we don't know what tone of voice he said this in. We don't see his body language. But just look at what he's saying. Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, if he had been there, when the, evidently he was not there when Jesus spoke that about the little infants, he might have had a different attitude. Because Jesus just got through saying, these little infants who haven't done anything, right? Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he just got through saying in the verse right before this, if you don't receive the kingdom as a little child, empty-handed, with nothing in your hands, nothing to boast about, uh, there's no way to get in. It, you can't come in based on your own actions and your own good behavior. And this ruler says, what good things shall I do? What shall I do, good master, to inherit eternal life? Now, verse 19, just look at this. Look at what he says. Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one that is God. Now, that's a funny way to respond. <laughs> You know, it's easy to read right over this and go on, but let's just ponder that for a minute. Jesus says, why do you call me good? He's sort of suggesting, I think, he's sort of implying that this man uh, came to him with a little bit of flattery. <laughs> why do you call me good? We know Jesus is good, don't we? Even Jesus isn't going to boast about it, and he's not going to allow this man to boast for him. And he's also suggesting, he says, let me just uh, explain to you something. If we're going to talk about good, there's nobody good but God. Isn't that what he says? There is none good. So, so if this man is getting ready to tell him that he's good, which he is, then Jesus is telling him right up front, hold on, before you tell me anything, let's just get one thing straight. There's none good but God. Now, this man has asked him a question. What do I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, there's none good but God. Then he says, you know the commandments, verse 20. Do not commit adultery. By the way, that's one of the things that the Pharisee in that parable boasted about, wasn't it? Is that right? Didn't we just hear in Jesus' story that the Pharisee that he condemned he criticized, said, I am not an adulterer. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. Verse 21. 
And he said, all these have I kept from my youth up. In other words, he says, I've done it all. I've done what's required. You know, if that's true and he felt confident about that, why is he even coming to Jesus in the first place asking these questions? Evidently, he didn't feel as confident as he's pretending to. But listen to what Jesus says to him. Jesus is very wise. We know that. He knows how to deal with, with everybody. And we're even told a little later that he loves this, his love for this, his compassion for this individual who is, can we say, he's boasting. <laughs> Would you agree that verse 21 uh, says, uh, imply, he says, all these have I kept from my youth up. Would you agree that that sounds a little boastful? Sort of like the Pharisee that we just heard about earlier. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing. So he's saying, okay, if you want to know, I'll tell you. Sell all that you have. Distribute to the poor. Then thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. Now, before we go on, let's just say this. Jesus never said this to anybody else. Only this one man. Jesus never preached this to multitudes. You know, uh, the whole monastic system in the Middle Ages is sort of based on people who thought that this little remark that Jesus made to this young ruler is sort of a law laid down for everybody. But he didn't, he didn't uh, tell everybody this. He only said that to this young ruler. And I'll tell you something else. Jesus often spoke in... Uh, in parables and in uh, ways which are deeper than what's on the surface. And I don't really think that the man's possessions were the problem. They perhaps were a symptom of what the real problem was. But he tells this man, let's just take it at face value, he says, okay, you just lack one thing. Sell all that you have, distribute to the poor, then thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. What he's saying is you have got to be empty-handed. You can't come in with all of your good works. You can't come in saying, I've kept all the rules. That's not how it works. You have to be like those little infants I was talking about a while ago, empty-handed. When he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye and for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now you can read all kinds of commentaries and interpretations about this camel going through the needle's eye. Uh, there's, a, there's a story uh, that there's a gate in the wall of Jerusalem that's very narrow, uh, it's very tight, and camels, if they go through, have to take their burdens off. They have to unload their burdens and go through. That story has circulated for a long time. I looked it up, by the way, just this last week, and that story has been around since the 15th century, but they, they're not really sure that there is such a gate even there. But, the, but it doesn't matter. There could be or maybe not, but the, here's the point. Uh, he's talking about something that's too big to fit. <laughs> you see that? Something, that, something that's, that can't fit. See, a camel can't, even if you're talking about a literal camel, you ever seen a real camel in real life? <laughs> and I know you've seen the eye of a needle. It's very small, is that right? There's no way that that camel's going to fit. He's too, it's too big. He's got too much. It's too big to fit. What he's saying here is, uh, you've, may I say, in reference to what we just said earlier, you've got to be empty-handed. You can't, it's not about you and your accomplishments and your works and your doings and your things that you're, you can't be boasting about anything. That's the real message of this. Now the disciples, when they heard this, verse 26, they said, who then can be saved? <laughs> you know what they're saying? They're saying, well, if that's the standard that you can't be rich, then who can be saved? Evidently, they regarded themselves. You know, it's funny. What's, what does rich mean? Well, you know, when I look at somebody like uh, Bill Gates or some big head of a corporation or some, you know, movie star or some, you know, famous person with, with mansions and cars and a swimming pool, I don't really feel rich. And you probably don't either. 
But if, if we went to some third world country where they don't really have the kind of uh, things that we have here, they think we're rich. They would all think we're rich. So it's kind of in, in, sort of in the eye of the beholder. It sort of um, depends on your attitude. And the disciples here are basically saying, if that's how it is, if, if you've got to be impoverished and have no possessions, who then can be saved? That's what they're saying. So if that's the standard, then nobody can live up to it. That's really what they're saying. Who then can be saved? Uh, look at what he says, verse 27. The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. What? Being saved. In other words, if it's going to be me having to do something, whether it's being impoverished or, or, or keeping the commandments or whatever it is, uh, who can live up to these impossible standards? I think Jesus said all the things he said previously just to say, if you want to, if you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven based on... You, See, the, the question was, what shall I do? So if you want to do and get in, you've got to really do. In fact, your doing has to match up to God's doing. So they're saying, who can be saved? And Jesus says, well, it's impossible for men. It's, impo it's humanly impossible. You know what, what's impossible? It's, in, it's humanly impossible to live up to God's standard and get in on your own. It's humanly impossible to enter into the kingdom of heaven based on your actions and your work, like the Pharisee boasting about all the things that he had done, like this rich young ruler saying, oh, I've kept all these things from my youth up. He says, the standard is impossible. But, he says, what's, what's impossible for you, it's possible with God. In other words, it's a work of God. Peter, you know, Peter's always got something to add. Then Peter said, lo, we have left all and followed thee. You remember when Jesus called the disciples, they left behind their fishing nets and uh, followed him. And he says in verse 29, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time, and in the world to come everlasting life. So he's saying to Peter, don't, don't worry about that. But let's not miss the, the bigger picture. The bigger picture is that it's not about doing, it's about trusting. That's what the whole issue is. Now, just in case you think that I'm trying to massage the, the text a little bit and soften what he's saying, what I'm saying is that this message about you've got to sell everything, isn't that what he told the rich young ruler? Sell all that you have. That's what he said. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, um, and then you'll have treasure in heaven. If you think that's what it is, uh, notice the very next chapter. This is chapter 18. Let's go over to chapter 19 just for a second. Luke, Luke chapter 19. What I'm saying is the issue is not your doing or what you have. It's where is your trust. That's the only issue. It has nothing to do with what you have in your pocket. It has nothing to do with what you've done or haven't done. It has nothing to do with what you might do in the future. It has nothing to do with uh, whether you gave to the poor or didn't give to the poor, none of that matters. The only thing that matters is where is your trust? Chapter 19, verse 1. Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. Now this right away reminds me of the publican that we read about in the parable. Remember that? He was chief among the publicans and he was rich. Just double checking. Yes, he was rich. So, if Jesus is going to be consistent, he's going to have to say to this guy at some point, okay, Zacchaeus, you've got to sell all that you have and give to the poor. Isn't that what he told the rich young ruler? Yeah. Guess what? He's not going to tell him that. That's uh, amazing. He was rich. Zacchaeus, verse 3, he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and he could not for the press, because he was of little stature. And he ran before and climbed up a sycamore tree to see him, uh, for he was to pass that way. And Jesus came to the place, he looked up, and he saw him, and he said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. He saw this, Jesus knew this guy was looking for him. Zacchaeus wanted to see him, and so Jesus evidently knew that. And he saw him up in the tree, and he said, come on down, I'm coming to your house. Verse 6. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. 
Did you see that? Zacchaeus received Jesus joyfully. He received him into his house. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that Jesus, he, Jesus, was gone to be the guest of a man that is a sinner. They thought, this is a terrible thing. This man's a sinner. And yes, he's a publican. They had that kind of reputation. That his doing was all wrong. His actions were, were wrong. Uh, but he received Jesus joyfully. Verse 8, Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And I, if I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore to him fourfold. Now, did you notice that Jesus didn't tell him to do that? He did it on his own. He just made his, up his mind. He just decided, I'm going to do this. What if he would have said, I'm going to give a quarter of my goods to the poor? That would have been okay too. What if he would have said, I'm going to give about 10% of my goods to the poor, and, uh, and uh, you know, if I've taken anything false, I'm going to give that back mm, twofold. That would have been okay too. It wasn't about his doing. It wasn't about how much he was going to give to the poor. What it was about, verse 9, Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, as much as he was also, he is also a son of Abraham. Verse 10 says, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Uh, he said, Salvation has come to this house. How did salvation come to this house? Because he received Jesus joyfully. He, was, he embraced Jesus. Uh, and he doesn't say it specifically in this text that he placed his trust in him, but I think that's implied. Uh, here's the message. Here's the point. It's not about your doing. We have to regard ourselves, where God is concerned, as empty-handed, like a little child. We don't have anything to boast about. We can't afford to be like the Pharisee who said, I thank thee that I'm not as other men. Um, the doing wasn't important. You notice Jesus never did turn around to this guy and said, wait a minute, wait a minute, Zacchaeus, that's not good enough. You've got to give everything to the poor. He just let it go. What Zacchaeus said he was going to do, that was what Zacchaeus made up his mind. He could have said anything. It was up to him. He had received Jesus joyfully, and his actions that then followed were his own decision, and, uh, and they just followed along as a product of his salvation. Now, uh, I said to you earlier that uh, Paul the Apostle is one who seems to have understood the theology implied by Jesus' teaching perfectly. And uh, no surprise, because he tells us that he got the message that he preaches straight from Jesus after the resurrection. I want you to notice something in the light of everything we've read. Something that Paul said in Philippians chapter th 3. You remember the parable that we read. It said that uh, Jesus spoke this parable unto some that trusted in themselves. Our trust is supposed to be in Christ and not in ourselves. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, just consider this in the light of everything we've read. Paul says in verse 3, Philippians 3.3, 3, For we are the circumcision which worship God in, in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. In other words, we don't trust in what we've done. We don't trust in what we do. We don't trust in ourselves at all. Verse 4, Though I, he says, might also have confidence in the flesh. In other words, I could, if I wanted to, trust in my doing, in my actions. If any man thinketh he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. In other words, if I wanted to, I could boast about my actions and my holy life and my righteousness and my goodness and all the things I've done. And then he begins to tell you all of his background, verse 5. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, like the Pharisee in the parable, who never did anything wrong, had all this right actions to boast about. Concerning zeal, that means energy. In other words, putting moral energy into something. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Listen to this. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He said, like the, he was just like the rich young ruler. You see, that's what the rich young ruler said. All these have I kept from my youth up. Isn't that what the rich young ruler said? Yeah. Paul, just like him, 
He says, concerning the righteousness that comes from keeping the commandments, I was blameless. All the, he could have said those same words, all these have I kept from my... He was just like that guy. But listen, Paul had to change his mind. See, that's what Jesus was getting at with that rich young ruler. He wanted him... He was trying to motivate him to change his mind, to change his attitude. Listen what he says next, verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss. Loss. That's what Jesus was telling that rich young ruler in a kind of a, a veiled form. You've got to lose all the things you're trusting in. He says, all these things that I just got through mentioning, Paul says, that were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. In verse 8 it says, yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss. In other words, I don't, I'm empty-handed. That's what he means. Like a little child. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things. He doesn't mean his property. He doesn't mean his color TV and his car and his wardrobe. He doesn't mean any of those things. He means all of those things that he trusted in before. I do count them but dung <laughs> that I might win Christ. I always hate to read this verse on Sunday morning. It's a little uh, awkward to read about dung in church on Sunday morning, but there it is. But he says, but see, he's using this strong language to say, not only am I just not going to tell you about all of my righteous actions. He says, I consider all of my own uh, good works that I could boast about, it's like dung to me. What's better? My trust in Christ. Look at what he says in verse 9. And be found in him. In other words, when you look for Paul, you're going to find Paul in relation to Christ. I just want to be found in Him. Listen, not having my own righteousness, in other words, I don't have any of my own to tell you about, which is of the law. See, He already said in a previous verse, the righteousness that comes from keeping the law, I was blameless. But He says, I, don't, I count that as a loss now. I count that as dung. I refuse to even consider that or tell you about it. I just want to be found in Christ, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness, that means justification, that means rightness, just like the publican that Jesus said, this man went down to his house justified, that's what righteousness is, rightness, right alignment with God, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now the good news about this is, you don't have to be the Apostle Paul. You don't have to be Peter. You don't have to be some superstar of faith. All you have to be is like a little child, empty-handed, and place your trust in Jesus. Like Zacchaeus, who everyone regarded as a sinner. He placed his trust in Jesus, and Jesus said, Today salvation has come to this household. We come to him with nothing to boast about, and as Christians, as we live our Christian life, uh, Christian life we still have nothing to boast about. And when you come to the end of your Christian life, Hopefully, uh, you won't look at your life and say, I'd like to boast for a while about all the good things I've done. Hopefully, this is the thought that's in your mind. I've only got one thing to say, that I put my trust in Jesus, and that's all I've got to say about it. You know, uh, sometimes, you know, because I really emphasize that the main thing as Christians that we're supposed to do is to trust in Jesus, to believe in Him, to put our faith in Him. Sometimes I've had uh, people say this to me, uh, ask how do I know if I'm really believing in Him? How do I know if I'm believing in Him? That's a good question, I think. Well, here's, here's one way. I'll tell you a little. Uh, imagine this little imaginary scenario. Jesus gave parables. I'm going to give you a little imaginary scene. Sometimes you might have seen these little cartoons in the newspaper uh, where a person is standing at the gate of heaven talking to St. Peter and they're having a little conversation. And uh, just imagine that your life is over. Just imagine that you've come to the end of your life and you're standing at the gates of heaven and there's St. Peter. He's not really there, by the way. He's got, I'm sure, better things to do than stand there and guard the door. But let's just, for the sake of this illustration, let's just say Peter says to you, you come, your life is over and you've come up to the gates of heaven. And Peter says, why should I let you in here? Well, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Would you say, well, I try to do the right thing. I try to do this. Uh, 
I always helped the poor, you know, I always, uh, you know, s supported the, the, you know, the orphan's home, you know, all these good. Is that what you would say? Well, that implies that you're trusting in yourself. What you should say, if you imagine this with me, what you should say if St. Peter or anybody else or some angel or somebody says, why should I let you in here? You should say, because I place my trust in Jesus Christ and that's all I've got to say. <laughs> that's all. That's the end of my story. I put my trust in Jesus and here I stand. Yeah, that's what Jesus is commending. That's what Paul is saying here is, is I count everything else as a loss. Is I just want one thing, to be found in Him. Not having anything of my own to tell you about, but just my right standing with God based on my faith in Christ. And the good news about it is we can all participate. This is a Christianity that we can all equally participate in. We don't have to be some super saint. You already, you know, here's the truth about it. There isn't any super saints. There's just one who's holy and his name is Jesus. There's just one who's righteous and his name is Jesus. And we enter into God's favor and heaven because we placed our trust in him, the one who is holy, the one who's righteous, and the one who is our savior. Okay, that's all I got today. Let's all stand up.